In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Matt Clark. By the age of 26, he had already built three multi-million dollar companies. He talks about how he did it. He talks about some of the big lessons along the way. We throw on some big numbers, but he breaks it down and talks about some of the mistakes and roadblocks that he had to overcome. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Matt Clark. Now, just to tell you about Matt, I got an email from my friend Anthony who says, I have to introduce you to Matt. He's a super smart guy. He's 26. He's built three multi-million dollar companies and he's the expert on how to use Amazon to generate giant sales for your product. So I'm like, all right, bring it. Let's, let's talk to Matt. So actually about Matt, Matt did a launch for a product teaching people how to build a business, selling these physical products, leveraging Amazon traffic, and you'll never guess how much they sold in seven days. I was astounded by it, $6 million in seven days. Now, unlike you know, a lot of people, Matt actually currently runs a business doing just that. So he sells his own brands of real physical products and he does $250,000 in profit per month and generates $600,000 in revenue per month. Matt, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yep, I'm Matt Clark, and uh, welcome, everybody. So Matt's going to talk to us. You know, we learn our most valuable lessons on uh, and how we grow on when we make mistakes. So Matt's going to give us his top advice for business owners, the big lessons he learned from mistakes and roadblocks he overcame through this business. And I also, before we get started on that, I'd like to include one fun fact. And fun fact about Matt, Matt was deciding between business and the special forces. And he does Krav Maga, which is taught to the Israeli military. So, Matt, first thing, what's a big roadblocker challenge you faced and how you overcame it? Yeah, a big roadblocker or challenge for me really was um, running and operating a business that has substantial margins. I think, you know, as a, as a startup entrepreneur, like, especially if you feel kind of like I did, that, you know, you're an entrepreneur to the bone, like, you don't really you care mostly about getting the business off of the ground, getting something off the ground and being able to say, I'm a business owner, I'm an entrepreneur, that sort of thing. But that's not the same thing as actually making money out of the business. So huge roadblock for me was getting over that hurdle of just wanting to run a business versus running a business that's profitable, which is the whole essence of business. If you want to take those profits and invest them in yourself, growing a bigger business socially, either way is perfectly fine. But the business first and foremost has to make money. So a huge roadblock for me was when I first got started, I was uh, selling you know, all the products I get my hands on through my own e-commerce stores. But it wasn't making a whole lot of money because the profit margins just weren't there no matter how good I was at advertising. So finally getting over that roadblock, moving into selling my own products with substantial profit margins instead of 30 to 40%, moving into products that make 400 to 500% makes business a lot more interesting, a lot more fun, and a lot more profitable and a real business that you can actually grow. So what was something you were seeing when you were selling other people's products? Something that I was seeing? Yeah, like what um, you said, obviously you were, you were selling the products. How was that doing for you? Were you making you know, any profit or what was that generating for you? Yeah, the thing is, is like when I was selling those other people's products, say you make 30 to 40% profit per sale like I was. Um, perfectly fine. I mean, that's still profit. If you do it in a whole lot of volume, that's still money. But to get customers in the first place, you have to spend money. So I was spending money, I became what I thought was the world's greatest expert at doing Google AdWords PPC, got fairly good, went to all the courses, did all that kind of stuff. But doing all of that, spending a lot of money, it was fine at first because I was able to track things and it was okay. I mean, I was working for a handful of products, was making decent profit, brought in my first employee and sort of started scaling from there. But then as I added more and more products, going back to the whole, you know, just wanting the business to grow at pretty much any cost, it became a mess to manage and you know it was just selling other people's products for those low margins there's nothing you can do i mean it, it, it's you got other people that are just they get stuck with inventory or they just want to build a business too so they'll start losing money all day long on advertising whereas you may be running a break even campaign they'll just spend more doesn't mean they're making money uh, but you have a constant stream of those kind of people promoting the same exact products as you and it really becomes a you know pretty bad situation like it did for me so how does that work? Because when you're paying for the physical products, it gets expensive. So do you put that on credit or how does that work? 
Yeah, so so the way I was doing it, and you know, is a way to scale up that kind of business, but it's still selling other people's products when it comes, you know, to the end of the day. But I was actually running completely drop shipped, meaning I wasn't buying any inventory ahead of time. So it's a decent cash flow business if you don't have to buy anything else to support your business, advertising, employees, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, when an order would come into the store, I would basically send that off to the manufacturer. They charge it to the credit card. I would have already received the money from the customer, and then stuff gets shipped out. Um, so that's basically how I was running. So that was one benefit: is that it was a dropship business, wasn't having to, you know, purchase a bunch of inventory ahead of time, which is what allowed me to scale it so fast, uh, for better or worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's one example of a big mistake that you made in the business? Yes, I mean, I think it would really come down to to not not tracking really what was going on. Um, I mean, it, it got to the point where I, I didn't want to check the American Express account. I didn't want to check the Chase Bank account. I didn't want to check the Google AdWords account because none of it was looking good. Uh, and it really came from, it wasn't like it happened overnight. It was something that took months and months and months of developed of trying to ramp up this business, just spending a bunch of money, not really tracking anything, just kept building up revenue. Like, I mean, I built it up to doing about, in about two years, to about $2 million in revenue. So not bad, I mean, from a revenue standpoint, but the profit wasn't there because I wasn't tracking a lot. Uh, so that, that really became a big problem when I found out that, you know, there was $100,000 on the unlimited Amex bill. You know, I don't know what they're doing giving an unlimited Amex bill to a 20, <laughs> 23, 24-year-old, however, however old I was. Uh, so, yeah, there's $100,000 wow. that, that the money was not there at all in the, in the checking account to be able to support and pay that off. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a stressful situation before I used to tell people that uh, before I became an entrepreneur, neck deep in that kind of situation, I honestly didn't used to think stress existed. I thought people were just complaining uh, until that sort of situation. So. so what did you do when you did start measuring? What did you actually implement? Um, so I mean the first thing was I started measuring everything that was going on with the business, all the you know advertising and finding out what was working, what wasn't working. Uh, because I mean, advertising, when you track it perfectly, if you're not doing any sort of big branding campaigns or anything like that, which for a small business makes almost zero sense unless it does, unless it's like a PR stunt, doesn't cost you any money. Uh, but but when you start measuring online advertising or any form of advertising from a direct response standpoint, it's pretty simple. Something either makes money and you do it more, or something doesn't make money and you either stop doing it or fix something about it. And it's pretty straightforward from that standpoint, but it all comes down to actually measuring what's going on. So that was a big thing. And also finding other forms of advertising, such as ramping up our email promotions and that kind of thing. Um, those other forms of low cost, almost guerrilla, mar guerrilla marketing forms of advertising, I really became essential to sort of digging, digging the way out of that hole. Yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of people fall in that trap. Like if we have sales coming in, that's good news, but we're not tracking the real specifics right. on the profit. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if, if, if you build a business around tracking that stuff on a daily basis, I mean, you'll never be in that sort of situation because with a bootstrap business, a business that you're growing organically, nothing crazy like that is really going to happen if you're tracking this on a daily basis rather than, you know, a few months down the road, be like, oh, crap, you know, we've been losing, you know, 500 bucks a day for the past two months. I mean, that's not yeah. a good situation to be in. Yeah. So how do you force yourself to do that? Because you knew you had to do it. You were scared to right. look at it. How did you force yourself to actually go in and go, I need to do this? Did you have someone I mean, else I, hold you accountable? Do you, like, what was your system? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing was is that I, it really got to the point where I was like, you know, because uh, I, I worked in finance for about seven months um, out of college. By that point, I probably should have known I wasn't really built to work for somebody else. But I knew that, like, you know, in that business, I mean, I came out of college, you know, it was a decent job. It was an okay job, you know, not bad. It was probably one of the better jobs out of uh, college. But it was working for a big finance company. And, you know, it's making about, you know, five grand a month or something like that, plus bonuses and all that kind of Good stuff. Good out of college, yeah. Yeah, yeah, decent job. So, but then I had, you know, friends that, you know, extremely smart people could be just as good of an entrepreneur, but they don't have that risk tolerance. They have parents that have worked for themselves or worked for other companies forever. So, but I knew that I was sitting there running my business, stressing out, you know, making less money than I was making there. And I was a year into it. And then, you know, I had guys back there that were, you know, now making double, triple that uh, because they moved up to the next level of being in that finance company. And I was like, crap. I was like, did I make the wrong decision? And I was like, wait a minute. I was like, no, I was like, I don't ever want to go back to that kind of thing. So it's kind of almost like that emotional, you know, sort of pull. They're like, okay, if I'm going to keep doing this business thing, I can't do it like this because this is not fun whatsoever. So I've got to do something about this. So this is actually a fun business to run. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was a huge turning point, but it really comes down to the reason most people take action. It just gets so 
emotionally upsetting that, that you're sort of forced to. Right. Now, in an ideal world, you start doing that stuff from the beginning, but for me, it took it took until that much time. There was so. enough pain in there that was yeah. you had to look at it. What yeah. about, were there any mistakes with, I know with running a company like that, you have staff, you have products. What about right. anything along those lines? Yeah, something that I've learned recently, which is kind of a, it, it, because, you know, whenever you're first starting out, you're kind of in like a catch-22 situation. Because to run a bigger, better company, you need more staff that are extremely qualified if you want to be able to give them stuff and they can actually you know, add value to the company. But to do that stuff, you need more money. So to make more money, you need staff. To hire staff, you need more money. Kind of a tricky situation. Right. So I mean, as a startup entrepreneur, I mean, the better way is going to be to do that is either raise some sort of money from friends, family members. I mean, to pay some like good employees for a few months, assuming you're able to turn over cash pretty quickly, it's not going to cost you, you know, an arm and a leg. A few thousand dollars, I mean, it's not that bad. Or maybe a better way is to find one or more business partners that can, you all can all sort of be committed to the same thing, splitting duties that are all equally committed to the business. Because something that's been extremely valuable in my business now that I didn't do before is before I'd just be trying to hire the sort of bottom line employee. Like for example, if I need a customer service person, I'd hire somebody, you know, Craigslist is not a bad source either way, but I'd hire somebody they just found on there for, you know, bare minimum. Like, okay, what does that kind of person get paid around here? 12 bucks an hour, so whatever. So I'd hire some people for 12 bucks an hour, and some of them are okay, but for the most part, they're complete crap employees because, like, that's that's their level of uh, you know desire and you know sort of commitment to the business is what you're paying them um, to start out with, anyways. But nowadays, like, we'll hire customer service people for our business, do exactly the same stuff that I was doing back then. Uh, but now we want to start them off at a high level. For example, you know the job market in Las Vegas, you know where, where one of our offices is. Job market in Las Vegas isn't like super great. Um, so we'll come in there and we'll pay a customer service person 20 bucks an hour as like a starting base pay because we want them committed to the job. We want it being the best job they have, and it's worked out phenomenally. Uh, I mean, the people we get are, are absolutely incredible. They're so committed to the job. They love the company. And, you know, obviously we treat them well and that kind of thing. And I used to do that fairly well, probably better now. But I think the real difference was is starting them off where, you know, all their basic needs are net. Um, and, and it's really a good deal for them. So that's been a huge turning point. It's kind of a lesson I guess I took from uh, Richard Branson. Uh, he recommends hiring uh, the best people, you know, paying them well to start out with. So, um really helps retain the best people and hire the best people. Yeah, that brings it. I want to talk about one of the big lessons you learned, but but you bring up a good point, which is finding good staff. What do yep. you look for in a good customer service period? I mean, there's a lot of people that do customer service. What's one thing that right. you found that's successful when you find someone good? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is like, it's, it's kind of funny because I remember I used to hire people when I was first starting out as an entrepreneur and I, you know, I went to college and I was like, you know, I know people that didn't go to college that are perfectly fine, but I always put on the, on the uh, job application, um, I always put, you know, you have to have a college degree for customer service business, like who the hell cares? And then now like that thought, like when I was recently hiring people for even more advanced positions here in Austin, it's not a thought that even crossed my mind. And it doesn't mean that the person shouldn't have been or that really matters or anything like that. But the thing is, is that, you know, what I've learned, it's much more important not hire people based on experience because, you know, who the heck knows, but it's really much more important to hire people based off of who they are as a person, what sort of commitment level that you think they're going to have in a position, which is kind of tough it's to very judge tough. Yeah. because we all, we all think we're, you know, super intuitive and everything like that. But uh, turns out, you know, I've read all the studies and that kind of thing. Like we're not as, as much as we think we are, especially when it comes to hiring people. Um, so, you know, recently, like I've taken a lot more referrals from uh, friends and family member. That's really the first place I like to go because at least, you know, they're good people. You can train people on just about any level of skill. But the question is, will they stick around? Will they be committed to the job? That's right. 10 times more important than what sort of existing skill levels or experience they have. Yeah, for sure. So what's one of the biggest lessons you've learned while running your business? I know you mentioned before it was important. You mentioned the business partner. Right. Yeah, so I mean, um, something that I've learned that's been extremely important, I actually just recently, literally uh, like a couple days ago, did a personality test sort of thing called the Colby test. Uh, it's K-O-L-B-E. Um, anyways, what it sort of does is analyzes how you take action. I was like off the charts, so black and white, quick start. 
which is perfectly reflecting on my business experiences, that makes perfect sense because I'm somebody who will fire and like when it, when it may take somebody else to get some sort of business product idea, anything off the ground, because they'll do all the due diligence and research and all that kind of stuff. It may take them, you know, three, four weeks. Like I'll have it done in a day for better or worse. I mean, it doesn't mean it's, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to have that to be an entrepreneur. But the problem with that is, is that I would do all that kind of stuff, be so wrapped up into it, it'd be so much fun. But the tricky thing is, is whatever it got, you know, profitable, making money consistent, that's when I get bored out of my mind. But that's where all the money comes from. The money doesn't come from getting things off the ground. It comes from actually reaping the rewards of once they're successful. So the big lesson for me has been, um, you know, it's tough to say because a lot of the business partners I have have kind of, you know, just because I put myself out there, I've joined networking groups and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that's a lesson in and of itself. Uh, But either way is trying to partner with somebody um, that really complements your skills. Like both the people I partnered with, I didn't know this at the time, maybe intuitively or subconsciously and that kind of thing, but both of them have turned out in two different businesses to sort of fulfill that role. They handle the majority of the operations. They handle all the back-end stuff. They make sure the business actually makes money on an ongoing basis while I'm sitting here doing what I do best, which is driving all this sort of front-end activity while they make sure it actually stays in place after after it's done. Right. So that allows you to have the entrepreneurial um, you know, ADD and you yeah. can do what you do best and then right, have someone right. else kind of you know, do the operation stuff and then you're yeah. constantly excited but still running those businesses. Right, right. The tricky thing is, is like I don't want to alienate anybody here because like when, when I tell people about that, people think that like, you know, there's different people. Like there's a Richard Branson type entrepreneur, there's a Warren Buffett type entrepreneur. Uh, very, very different. You don't have to be one or the other because, for example, like one of my business partners, both of them are actually older, but one of them, you know, he's about 40 years old, but he has never worked for somebody else. Like literally never worn a suit for no reason, been running his own business, real estate, selling products, all that kind of stuff entrepreneur to the bone but he definitely is much more operationally focused and that sort of thing so it's a good synergy I mean, he's an entrepreneur just as good as I am um, it's just a different skill set but you really need both of them if you really want to make a big business so does anyone tell you like when when you mentioned business partner that you know that's advice that you've gotten have you heard any getting negative people you know people who say negative things about business partner just do it on your own yeah a lot of people I think where they mess up with business partners is they choose people like I've had so many friends and family members and all this kind of stuff that like, you know, they see that if I'm doing well in a business that like, you know, they have some idea or something they want to partner with and this kind of thing. And most of the time I'm like, no, because I want to know that you've proven that you can do something on your own or at least, you know, in some respect that you're a smart person that you can, you know, take responsibility and all that kind of stuff because just partnering with somebody just because you like them socially does not mean that they're whatsoever going to be successful in business. And it almost is not a good thing because chances are if you are good friends with them socially and all that kind of thing, it's likely because they're a lot like you. So they probably have a lot of your strengths, a lot of your weaknesses, which doesn't really give you the complimentary benefits you can get from uh, working with somebody else that you obviously still need to like them. They still need to be a good person, match you ethically and morally and all that kind of stuff. Uh, But they can sort of pick up where you leave off and vice versa. So I think that's a big thing is – Working with only successful people. I mean, somebody else may be your best friend on the planet, but it, they may not be your best business partner. Yeah. Likely may not be. Yeah. So talking about some of the lessons, challenges, what's one big milestone that you're especially proud of that you accomplished because you overcame some of these? Right, right. I think it's something related to, uh, I mean, it's it's related to what you brought up at the beginning of this in, in the intro. I mean, I think a huge milestone for me It's really actually coming up, but it's sort of the second part of what what I've already done. So I've always, you know, I I like public speaking. I did business plan team, all this kind of stuff when I was in uh, in college. I like public speaking, like putting myself out there and that kind of thing. I'm not going to be a singer. I'm not going to be a musician, anything like that. But my sort of self-expression, I guess, is is doing that kind of thing. Uh, So a huge thing for me. I've always wanted to sort of put on my own events. That's how I've always seen myself when I visualize, you know, success in the future. It's that kind of thing. So literally, I mean, it's right now May 8th. I'm looking at the calendar up there. May 8th on May 30th, 31st, and June 1st is when we're putting on a seminar. It's my first seminar to actually put on. It's for people that did, you know, for the $6 million launch we we did about a month and a half ago. It's for people that signed up for that. But, I mean, this first seminar I've ever put on is going to have 700 people in it. I mean, to me, that's awesome. It's going to be a great experience. Uh, Fortunately, I know not to try to manage or run that thing myself, so I've hired somebody who actually knows what they're doing. I was going to say, we'll have an interview after that event of the challenges of running a 700-person event the first time. Step one, hire somebody who actually (laughs) knows what they're doing. (laughs) So tell me about the launch itself. That's pretty amazing. 
right. So right. what was some of the feelings you were having as that was going on? What, you know, what were you thinking? Yeah, I know. I know you're really big on stories, so you'll like this one. Is that you know, whenever you do these kind of big launches, it's like compressing a year of business into seven days. So year, like five years. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's super, super stressful. I mean, because like, if, for example, if you have a website for your regular business, it's down for a day, not going to kill it over the course of a year. If your website's down for an hour during while you have all kinds of thousands and thousands and thousands of people visiting it, everyone hopefully whipping out their credit card, uh, it's a huge issue. So you can't have that kind of stuff going on. So you almost need 24 hour sort of being able to watch the thing. So for whatever reason, after we do all this months and months of work to get all these people on board to promote it on the very first day, the card opens at noon for whatever reason, I don't know what the heck we were thinking. We scheduled a webinar, a live webinar, from 12 to 2 that very first day when the cart very first opens, which is when the, all the biggest problems happen. So me and my business partner had done a bunch of webinars before. We had kind of a good flow. So he'll basically do an introduction along with the people hosting the webinar, and then I'll kind of go off and do my own thing. But I knew that like because of that, he was he had to manage the launch. Like Somebody had to be there. Right. So he'd be off doing that while I was doing the pitch, and he wasn't going to be there at the end like normal. So I'm sitting there at the end of the webinar, like two hours into this deal. I can't really get a feel because I can only see my screen because I just had my 13-inch laptop because I was living in France at the time, which is a whole other lesson. Don't do that while doing a launch. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was sitting there on my laptop two hours into this thing. Cart's been open for two hours. I can't really get a feel from the guys on the webinar because they can see the cart and how many sales they're generating during the webinar. I can't get a feel if it's going good or if it's absolutely tanking because it wasn't like, oh my God, you know, we're getting so many sales. So I was like, oh crap. I was like – is this thing freaking tanking? Like I'm stuck in like this one screen, like PowerPoint slide. I'm like, man, I have no idea what's going on in like the outside world. I was like, is this thing tanking? Whatever. Uh, so I got done with that thing. First thing I did was check my email. And then I got one of my other business partners. He's like, yeah, he's like, he's like we're two hours into this. I've already crossed the $700,000 mark. Wow. And like, he's a guy that has a lot of experience. So when he was excited about it, I knew, I knew we were doing well. So yeah, that was, a, it was an interesting experience. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> on that note, so... What was one? Was there any big pitfalls with the launch? Because when you compress that amount of info and stuff in that short amount of time, yeah. Because um, I, I mean, mean from the surface, like you said, people just see seven days, six million. That seems unbelievable, but it, it's a ton of work building up to that point, and they don't see that stuff. What's one of those challenges you face with the launch? I mean, I think the. Uh, I mean, we have you know had all the typical problems. Like you hear a lot of internet. I mean, internet marketing's been going on for a while, so there's a lot of less than you know um extremely moral people i guess and they'll be like oh yeah we broke a server and blah 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 and it's complete bs just to inject some scarcity we literally had all those problems um this late you know i don't know but you know fortunately my business partners managed all that uh but yeah i mean we've we've had payment processor problems all that kind of stuff because it freaks anybody out no matter what you've done in business when all of a sudden you drive you know six million dollars in cash through a payment processor uh, freaks them out a little bit <laughs> like what the heck is this they're like we only gave you this sort of limit we're like yeah we told you we were going to surpass it surpass it so so yeah but i mean a huge huge lesson in all this kind of thing is that i'm glad that i don't do that for a living because i actually run a business that does it in you know in real life meaning i don't just teach it and teach theory and say oh this right. stuff could work now go do it um i actually do it so i know what works and that kind of thing i think that's part of what made it so success successful was because it was actually real I could sit there and tell anybody face to face, you know, like we are on uh, on video, and tell them face to face. Look, behind the scenes, on recording, off recording, I don't care who we're talking to. This, in my opinion, is the absolute best opportunity for anybody to build a business online or lot offline. Period. There may be some other people that have different opinions, but I could say that 100% honestly. I think that helped a lot throughout the entire process. Yeah, and I'm going to ask about that in a second. But so yeah. first, what would be, you know, someone is running their business now. Um, what would be the best piece of advice that you have for them that they should know? Um, I think it's probably to measure what's going on on a daily basis. Don't ever let anything go by without you know keeping track of what uh, what performance advertising is doing, how much profit your business is making on a daily basis. Because if you, as soon as you stop tracking that stuff, is as soon as it gets out of control. Mm -hmm. I've known, even in myself, like I, I, I'm not the person who likes to track all that kind of stuff. I don't like digging into data and into details or any of that kind of stuff, but I make myself track the profit and performance of each business on a daily basis. And that sort of discipline really, you know, because the thing is, like, I can't remember the quote, but, you know, some super successful entrepreneur that's, you know, built some massive, you know, business. It, it's sort of a generic product, you know, something that's not super sexy, but it's done extremely well. His big sort of lesson for people was to, 
your job as an entrepreneur is basically to find problems and fix them. And I'm somebody who's like, ah, I just want to avoid that. I'd much prefer to focus on this fun stuff and building this other business. But really, the earlier and quicker you fix those kind of problems, the better. And a lot of that comes from monitoring what's going on on a daily basis. And you build that discipline early, it'll pay off you know, really for the less, rest of your business life. Yeah. And I'm coming from somebody who doesn't like doing that stuff naturally. Yeah. I mean, I could see that you two ends of the spectrum. One, someone is just spends too much time looking at the stats because they just love right. looking at the stats. Right. Does that ever happen yeah. to you where you're just like wasting time just looking at your stats? Yeah, yeah, I mean it does happen because like I remember we, we launched a uh, first version of this course we just did and there's, you know, some of the payments are being processed through something called ClickBank. For Some people are familiar with it, some people are not. It's just a, a marketplace where you can have products and recruit affiliates and et cetera, et cetera, and it serves as a payment processor. So I remember I'd be on there, like, rather than doing real work, I'd sitting on there clicking refresh, clicking refresh, mm. clicking refresh, because it was, it was doing well, but it's, you know, really just a waste of time. I mean, you're much better off, you know, scheduling those kind of things maybe once in the morning, once, you know, sometime in the middle of the afternoon. Because the thing is, is like, you all, it's kind of like checking email with any of that kind of stuff, is that you want to make sure that whenever you check that kind of stuff, you're in a position where you can actually do something about it. Right. So if you're, you know, sitting on an airplane or if you're about to go to sleep, you check a stat and something's out of whack and then you're like, oh, crap, and you just stress out about it. That doesn't do you no good. But I mean, I think right. scheduling times to do that kind of stuff, morning, mid-afternoon, that kind of thing, and then not doing it outside of that because it can become a huge waste of time. Yeah. So, Matt, what's the best of advice you've gotten from a mentor for your business has been most valuable? Right. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to this, this, the, the partnership aspect. I, I remember one mentor told me because I, I always had the feeling is before I had any business partners, I was hiring employees and just didn't really like it. It wasn't quite what I wanted. Um, because I always thought it'd be a lot more fun with a partner and that kind of thing. And he, a mentor of mine, had built and sold an extremely successful business, had a business partner in the whole process. And I was like, you know, what was that like? I was like, what, what did you think about having a business partner? What's your advice there? He's like, well, he's like, you know, having a good business partner makes the good times even better and the bad times less bad. And then I was like, cool. So I was like, I need to find me a business partner. Um, so yeah, I mean, from there, I mean, really bringing on extremely successful business partners. We, we, you know, at times one person's carrying more weight than the other, but as long as there's a natural flux, you know, uh, fluctuation, which allows those business partners to flourish. I mean, it can be an extremely rewarding thing. Right. Business can not only be more successful, but it's, you know, exactly like, exactly like you said. I mean, when there's bad things going on, it's, it's business. There's always bad things going on on some level or another, when those kind of things happen, it's not you freaking out, you know, why, you know, am I stupid? Do I just not know how to do this kind right. of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You talk with the other person, they're in the exact same situation. It's like, okay, more of how can we work through this? What do we need to do? What lessons are to learn? Okay, let's move on. Right. So yeah, it's been extremely rewarding. Yeah. That's why it's important for people to listen to you on, on this topic is because they feel like they're not alone and like they're not going crazy. Yeah. There's other people experiencing the exact same, you know, problems. You know, they're not right. measuring, or you know, maybe they need help in their, you know, their DNA or their personality is right. taking them off in a different direction. Um, man, I have one last question for you before I ask it. I want to just hear a little bit more about what your, you know, your business, what you're working on now, and what's exciting for you now. Sure. So, uh, I mean, I've always known I wanted to run an extremely big business. Like I'm not the person who I like taking trips like everybody else. I mean, just lived in France for three months, but I'm not the person who just wants to build a nice lifestyle business and live on a beach. And you know, that's my entire business aspiration. That's not the case. I want to build a big, successful, rewarding business. Um, so pretty much anything I've done in the past, it's been like, okay, this is cool. This can make money. I'll learn something from it. But I've never really seen something that I think could fulfill the aspirations I have for that until recently. With the business I have, actually selling real physical products. What I think of as I'm building with a business partner is, you know, kind of like a Procter and Gamble for the 21st century. Um, I like to add the tagline, you know, a lot, but a lot cooler, because you know they're known from some pretty bad things, you know, animal testing, et cetera, et cetera. So not that aspect, but the general concept of building your own product brands, different markets, but your really core expertise is good packaging, good labeling, distributing the products, making sure you have good products that people want. Um, so that's really the most exciting thing for me right now. We have two product lines we're rolling out. Our goal is to have 10 within the next uh, 18 months. 
and really making that business as big as possible. Um, so that's that's something super exciting to me because it's the one business I've ever run. You know, I'm 26. I say ever run, really the past four years. Uh, but it's the one business I've run to this point that really has that sort of potential. So it's super exciting for me. Uh, but then on the other side also, like I said, I mean, super excited about the live event. I mean, that's going to be extremely rewarding, and I plan to do those kind of things for a long, long time. So is there a site that you can point people to find out more information about you or the event, or where should they go? Yeah, really the best place to keep up is uh, if you go to mclarkinc.com. That's just like my name, Matt Clark, but just the M, M Clark, and then inc.com. Um, you can like, you can see links to my Facebook page, uh, like that there, follow the blog, do all that sort of stuff. That's a great way to keep in touch. Um, that's where I'll end up posting most of the things. So what are you most excited about the event? Uh, really being able to... Uh, speak with that many people from the stage for that extended period of time because I've spoken at live events and it's cool but you're up there for like 45 minutes and I really want to I've done a decent amount of public speaking but I really want to see what it's like doing that thing for three days straight because I think that's how you get really good because I know like the whole Tony Robbins thing I mean, he's known as being like one of the best public speakers in the world and I remember one time like I'm not going to say it here because he definitely he'll, he'll go off if you if you go to one of any of his conferences like he'll start cussing because he gets super emotional about it but he's remember somebody telling him early in his career oh you know you're so lucky because he was doing sales he's like oh you're so lucky and he was like ah he's like f you he's like I'm over here doing you know 10 times the amount of you know little seminars and all that kind of thing than you are I and mean, that's why I get these results not because I'm lucky Right. Um, so I mean, there's that huge aspect of being able to sort of really put myself on the line out there for three days straight. So that's going to be super exciting. But also getting to a lot of online entrepreneurs don't get to do this is getting to meet their customers in person. Right. I've met a few of them, but that's that's going to be awesome because I mean we have a lot of good stories about people doing came from nothing that are doing extremely well with this business model, and it really is if somebody applies it can be life changing. So it's awesome to hear those kind of things. People that were struggling financially, no longer struggling financially, have families, and all that sort of impact affects them all the way down the line. And it's really awesome to have that sort of human connection in person at the live event. So what was the product called, the, the actual product that people got that they're going to be attending the live event? So people... Yeah, Amazing Selling Machine. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, if you go to the domain, AmazingSellingMachine.com, it is not available whatsoever. If you do want to go to it, you can fill out the form. We may relaunch it in the future. Uh, right now, our 100% focus, like it should be, is on helping our people that have signed up before, right. doing the live event, all that kind of stuff. But after that, we'll probably be revisiting opening the doors. So if anybody's interested, that's where you go. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of enough. He's, he is not even selling anything today. So it's kind <laughs> of for you to give us your advice. Um, yeah. So my last question for you, Matt, was I was asking several business colleagues, friends. I'm talking to Matt. He's a superstar. What should I be asking him? And they said, you know, Jeremy, that's so obvious. What everyone wants to know is what's the quickest way for me to start making money right now on Amazon? So I said, I'll ask. We'll see what he says. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to the old business and marketing rule. A lot of people, human, humans, you know, by nature, we're creative. We love to do new things. There's 7 billion people on the planet. Nothing you do is going to be new uh, in business. And that can get you in a lot of trouble, too, that, that sort of innate drive. The easiest and fastest way to make money in business and on Amazon is by finding something that's already working and doing it the same or a little bit better. It's not really much more complicated than that. So, I mean, you, you for example, Amazon has top 100 bestseller list for every product category out there. They're telling you which products are selling the best. Go look through those products, find something that you can create your own of, which for a lot of products I and mean, the business model that I recommend is private labeling. Meaning finding a generic product that fits the same sort of needs as a product you see selling well on Amazon already. Not something you think will sell well, but something that's already selling well. Finding a generic version of that product, having them put your own custom label packaging on there, and going from there. And basically applying anything else you learn about marketing, about uh, you know how to, how to get any sort of demand built up for your product, whether it's through Facebook, SEO, any sort of paid advertising, any of that kind of stuff. Apply it to an Amazon product because not many people are doing that. Obviously, the people I teach, that's what I've taught them. Uh, but pretty much nobody else is doing that because the majority of people who sell products on Amazon treat it just like, just like another way to sell products. They likely run their own little e-commerce store. They're like, ah, I should probably have my products on Amazon. And that's really the extent of their Amazon business. You, right. by focusing on that as a business model, finding a product that's selling well, getting your own up there, putting a lot of marketing effort and focus into it, which is a whole other discussion, um, you, can do, you can do extremely well. And that's really where it's all at. Yeah, so Matt, what motivates you? Because obviously you're doing really well. You're young. You just went to France for three months. 
What motivates right. you financially? Yeah, I mean, spe- specifically financially, I, I was reading or listening to an audio book one time. It was called How to Be a Billionaire. Sounds a little funny. I mean, whatever. It's actually an extremely good book. I mean, it's got real good, legitimate advice from the biggest business titans of the past you know, 100 years or so. But something really interesting that struck me there about myself personally that, that I read in there, they said that like a lot of these extremely wealthy people that are so driven regardless of you know how far they are past their actual financial needs, it's not because they've come from nothing. I'm not somebody who came from you know dirt poor, then all of a sudden I'm doing well, that kind of thing. I mean, sort of middle of the road, I guess. Um, but they say what a lot of time drives them is they a lot of times had entrepreneurs as parents, at least one of them, and experienced as an entrepreneur will ups and downs in the business. When you're a little kid in elementary school like I was, and all of a sudden, you know, one week, your dad's like, okay, good, you know, we've got all this money, we're doing good, you know, let's get whatever we want, you know, let's go on trips and this kind of thing. And the next week, you know, business is down that week, I guess. Um, then, you know, same dad is like, oh, yeah, we're going to have to, you know, have a moratorium is what my dad used to call him and cut back spending for, you know, a week, a month or whatever it is. As a little kid, I mean, tiny little kid in elementary school, it doesn't really register the time. You're like, well, this kind of sucks. I don't really understand this. But right. I think... For me personally, a lot of people that are extremely financially driven, like they're just getting ingrained in your psychology where you don't ever want to experience those downsides. Yeah. Like so driven financially, for better or worse, that, that ends up not wanting to be the case. But fortunately, you know, like we we're sitting here talking about, I do realize that it's not something I necessarily care to change, but it is something you have to, take, to be aware of because you do have to take time to actually enjoy the fruits of all that. I mean, like I said, I mean, living in France for three months, going to Thailand, you know, for a few weeks uh, next month. I mean, though, that's that's really relationships, friends, family, people you love, that kind of thing is what life's all about. But, right. you know, that's what drives me financially anyway. So what was the best part about France? Um, I think the coolest thing was is that, you know, we – you don't really need a car. We were in Nice, France, in the French Riviera. had an awesome place with ocean view, all that kind of stuff coolest thing was is being able to go down walk literally outside of our apartment pay one euro to, to jump on the bus and go to some crazy places that people fly across the world to go to um there's one little small town called villefranche which is awesome to visit small town beautiful go to monaco you know where the whole james bond casino thing is shot one euro about a 20 minute bus ride right from outside of our apartment uh so yeah i mean it was amazing being in that kind of position we went to both those you know probably 10 times each it's just not something you really get experience very often it's amazing so everyone listen to matt measure track find a good partner matt i appreciate your time i know you're busy thanks so much for uh, joining us and giving us your advice yeah thank you very much for having me hope everybody got some uh, value out of this definitely